Good morning and welcome. For our call to worship this morning, I want to read what you can see on the screen and then I want you to read it and then we'll read it together. God rules. There's something to shout over. On the double, mainlands and islands celebrate. Bright clouds and storm clouds circle round him. Right and justice anchor his rule. God rules. There's something to shout over. On the double, mainlands and islands celebrate. Bright clouds and storm clouds circle around him. Right and justice anchor his rule. God rules. There's something to shout over. On the double, mainlands and islands celebrate. Bright clouds and storm clouds circle round him. Right and justice anchor his rule. So, welcome to worship this morning here at St Andrew's Uniting Church. All are welcome and we come to, to continue our celebration of the life and revelation of Jesus. In the church calendar, today is the seventh Sunday in Easter. This week's theme is our response to seeing salvation, goodness, and the love of God in our lives. In the call to worship, we heard the psalmist telling us that because the Lord reigns, the whole earth should be glad. Our readings today will point towards God's everlasting love and a new creation. Love divine, all loves excelling. Before we get to there, we'll now have an acknowledgement of the first peoples, and it's a way of paying respect to the first peoples whenever we gather together, and an important expression of the covenant which the Uniting Church has with the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress. So I'll now ask Iris to lead us in the acknowledgement of country. As we gather, we acknowledge that the land on which we worship today was cared for by the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the indigenous people of this region for thousands of years. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and commit ourselves to work for justice and reconciliation for all First Peoples. So our prayer of approach today starts with a call for action. The prophet Micah said, What does the Lord require of you? Only to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. So let's pray. God of mercy and source of justice, pour on your people such love and compassion that we cannot remain silent. We cannot tolerate injustice and poverty. As your grace fills our hearts, so may we be stirred into action to demonstrate your love for all the world and for all creatures that live and move on this earth. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are caught up in our own busyness. We want to see promises fulfilled in our lifetime, an end to poverty and corruption, the saving of our earth from climate change, the powerless lifted up and the powerful brought down. We want peace on earth now and to live in harmony the rest of our days. Like the disciples of old, we confess that we desire your kingdom to come to earth with worldly power instead of us working for your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Call us into your ways and to know that while we may not see the fulfillment in our lifetime, our work is necessary, our love matters, and all that we strive for will make a difference for your reign, for yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter day and night shall not cease. These ancient words spoken to Noah after the flood 
remind us of your steadfast love that endures forever. The earth endures from the beginning of creation and so shall your love for us. No matter the struggles we face now, we will make it through by your love for one another. God loves us so much that you sent your son Jesus to us that whoever believes may have eternity now. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but in order for the world to be saved. Help us to share this good news. God loves, endures forever, and there is no condemnation in Jesus. God of mystery and wonder, we do not fully understand how you came to be among us in the flesh through the incarnation, but we know it. We do not understand how you came to us on that third day after suffering and death and the finality of the tomb, but we know it. We do not understand how you ascended to heaven, wrapped in clouds and hidden from our sight, but we know it. And we do not understand how you are returning to us, except that it will be in an unexpected way, for we know that you are a God of mystery and wonder, making all things new, bringing light out of the face of the deep and life out of death. We are in awe of you, O mighty one, and come before you in our worship, our prayers, and our praise. Amen. Now let's hear the good news. And it was as written in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 7. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. Amen. So a word of peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant, and grant it that peace and unity, which is according to your will. And I would invite you to, in whatever way you feel comfortable, just to share the peace with the people sitting around you. So, peace, in Jesus' name. So a few notices, um, Penton Hills worship, but it's not this Sunday, it's the third Sunday. Wags breakfast, so on next Saturday morning at 8.30 at Loot, and Jean Sheriff needs to know numbers, so if you're planning to come, let Jean know. Um, Claire has prepared our notice sheet for the last two months and we say thank you to Claire, beautiful job. And we hand over it now to Jan who will collate the newsletter. Uh, on Monday the 6th, the CCC afternoon tea and uh, it will be a celebration of the Jubilee, Platinum Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. So you know people who'd like to be part of that, get them here. Uh, and we're going to start our series of Bible studies and it's called How to Make a Cup of Tea. Sounds interesting. Unpacking the Bible for Life Today. And uh, there are the details there about how you can be involved and a suggestion you do some reading. Uh, and the <coughs> reflective, uh, the notes about the walk around Moon Reserve uh, are available and if you'd like to go and do it sometime, take those with you and enjoy. 
One other notice that uh, I have to tell you is the sad news that Denise Klinger died on Thursday. Um, Denise's funeral, it's uncertain yet when it will be. Uh, it is expected it will be at Living Faith Church in Greensboro, uh, where she came to us from, uh, but possibly in about a fortnight. And now we're going to join in the singing of Love Divine, but I think Jonathan wants to say something. Sorry, Iris, we seem to be jumping up and down a bit, but we haven't knocked each other over yet. So our first hymn will be a well-known hymn written by Charles Wesley, Love Divine or Love's Excelling. It's not all that modern, dating back to 1747, but think of it as both a hymn and a prayer. It was first published in a collection of hymns entitled Hymns for Those That Seek and Those That Have Redemption in the Blood of Jesus. So it's written around a progression of thoughts. One, praying for the return of our Lord through the second coming. Two, prayers for the finalization of the new creation. And three, our prayers for the Holy Spirit. I have to have a slight confession here because Wesley was influ influenced by the words of a fellow called Joseph Addison who happens to be a long dead ancestor of mine. But his words started off, when all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I'm lost in wonder, love and praise. So love divine, all loves excelling.
when we come to our gospel reading shortly, we will hear Jesus' prayer for future believers. This prayer, and you'll hear it later, is not for believers of long ago, but for all, both here and around the world. The dominant concern is for unity and divine glory. This is a prayer for as yet unachieved Christian unity. But then we come to verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Firstly, note that Jesus uses the term I want or I desire for all of us to be given his glory and a place in his kingdom. This is both powerful but also fills us with hope. Jesus wants us there. And if we think back to John chapter 3, we're all very familiar with John 3 verse 16, but let's read on to verse 21. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and everlasting life. God didn't go to all that trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. So the passage focuses on God's gift of Jesus through whose death we can have eternal life. I sometimes think it's so widely known in Christian circles that its impact may have been blunted, but it's a verse that deals with the profoundest mysteries of the faith, with life and death, a sacrifice and an eternal hope. It calls for a response, an existential choice between light and darkness. And that is what Jesus is praying for in the earlier verse, which will come to us in today's reading. It seems to me that one of our great struggles is the dichotomy between a world that celebrates wealth and personal advancement and one where we walk humbly in the sandals of the carpenter. Can we share love, kindness and reconciliation to all we meet? And for those who struggle with the word or concept of love, just think of it as deep caring and empathy. The thing is, we can be the pew in the street by just walking with people, for caring about the people we meet, even those who may seem a little odd to us from time to time. I think this week we should also be aware that this week in Australia will be Reconciliation Week. National Reconciliation Week this year runs from the 27th of May to the 3rd of June. And its theme is, be brave, make change, and is a challenge to all of us, individuals, families, communities, organizations, and government, to be brave and tackle the unfinished business of reconciliation so we can make change for the benefit of all Australians, all who live here. This is also part of what it means to walk with Jesus. Justice stands at the heart of God. Justice is nothing other than love which seeks to understand, resist, and overcome the structure of oppression. Bearing witness to the love of God 
involves working for justice. There can be no reconciliation between non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal Australians without a commitment to the worth of human beings, concern about their destruction and a commitment to justice for all people. And I think that applies to all people. It's not just reconciliation with First Nations people. It's all of us. We need to reconcile with those around us, particularly where there has been perhaps enmity or maybe just misunderstanding. So whether it's in families or communities, we need that caring empathy. Jesus prayed for future believers, us, to choose between light and darkness and desires to be where he is. He came and dwelt amongst us, not to condemn but to repair. So we're now going to go to the Bible readings, but immediately after the readings, and without further introduction, we will sing another hymn by Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? This was written in 1738 as a response to his conversion. But I wonder if we can still feel the same amazement that Jesus came and died for us, that we might live in ultimate freedom. Personally, I first encountered this hymn when at boarding school in North Wales and was particularly taken with verses 4 and 5. So when we stand or sit and sing it, we also need to listen and read the words as a prayer of hope and amazement. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And so we'll now come to the readings swap places again. This morning there are three readings and John, Jonathan has been talking about this one. Um, to me this one is like as if we're listening in. We just happen to be nearby and we heard Jesus praying. Judy Mus is going to read the second reading for us, and then I'll read the third reading. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be the one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me wherever, where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The second reading is in, from Acts 16, 16 to 34. Paul and Silas are in prison. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrate and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in, in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because... He thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and he set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Now this final reading from Revelations, to me, it's like as if a person in the God is, is speaking at first, but the last three verses are John speaking. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic acts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of, the prophet, of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, 
I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen.
I've entitled this piece, A Change of Plan and a Change of Vision. And we covered that in part, I think, last week. But before we start, just a, a note about that picture on the screen. It's not terribly clear in, in this light, but it's a photograph taken about 11,000 feet up in the small country of Lesotho, looking down into South Africa. And Joan and I were taken up on that windy road in... Um, a Land Rover and there were a group of us, so there were several of them. I didn't tell Joan until we got back down in the fog that I'd noticed that the tyres on that particular Land Rover were actually quite bald, and it's a very treacherous road. But if any of you have either seen the film Cry Freedom or know the story of Donald Woods, that is the road he used to escape South Africa with the... Um, story of Steve Biko and was thus able to be flown out to London and the world heard the story of Steve Biko. But it, it's a fairly treacherous and windy road and I think we find them in life from time to time. So our readings today follow from the message we heard last week. The first reading from Acts follows on from the story that we heard last week of the conversion of Lydia. Being a disciple of Jesus and walking in his sandals is not a straight line. We will be confronted by hurdles, challenges, and changes of plan, even a change of vision. Last week, Pastor David asked, Is the Holy Spirit calling you? In the book of Acts, we see Paul was often called upon by the Holy Spirit to change plan, whether it be on the Damascus Road or the Macedonian Call. And you know what? This still happens to all of us even today. In different ways, God understands our own personalities and um, levers. And um, I know that I have been persuaded to change direction in a variety of ways that I cannot always explain why and cannot and should not over-spiritualize. But I remember when I was with African Enterprise, our team leader or then team leader in Zimbabwe wanted me to go and visit the team in Zimbabwe and I'd failed to do that up until that time until he called me one day and said, Jonathan, have you not heard the Macedonian call? I heard it then and I went. Even now, he is pleased that I did hear that call, visited in, he and his family in his house, walked in their sandals in Harare and some of the outer districts, and got a better understanding of their own peculiar challenges. And it's important we do listen to those calls and walk in other people's shoes. So Paul responded to that Macedonian call, and he changed directions. In verses 9 and 10 of that chapter we read, During the night Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And the rest of the story follows. Paul and his colleagues then ended up in Philippi, the conversion of Lydia, but also the challenge of being thrown into prison for speaking the gospel. Yes, it is a challenge and a risk. But notice what happened next. When their chains fell off, the missionaries did not escape. They waited. And when a terrified jailer came, knowing that he was in all sorts of bother if he had lost the prisoners, they were still there and called for light. The jailers were amazed. What was, must we do to be saved, they asked. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The magistrates saw what happened and ordered the men's release. Surely this was the work of the Spirit and brought the gospel to the important trading city of Philippi. All because Paul listened to that Macedonian call. We heard an echo of this in the hymn we've just sung. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. 
Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And that was the experience that Wesley felt at his conversion. That's the experience that Paul felt. So it's a sense of liberation if we can believe in and follow the living Jesus. And we heard even earlier the reading from John on Jesus' prayer for all believers. Jesus came to liberate us from the chains of the deceiver. And as he ascended to the heavens, he left us with the Holy Spirit, that we too may hear his call and walk in his sandals. For most of us, it is not as dramatic as the call for Paul, but can we still listen to that still, calm voice telling us to turn left or to turn right? It is an adventure with unexpected twists and turns and unexpected consequences. A bit like that road there, that had a lot of unexpected twists and turns. It was a bit alarming when you see sort of snow still piled up in the corner, but we made it. So our final reading was from the book of Revelation. And it seems to tie the whole of time together and then take us beyond time. And remember, our notion of time is limited to human time from Adam until the second coming. So if you could imagine that God's infinite time runs from that wall there to that wall there, Human time, as we know it, may be no thicker than that book. We live in a short period of time. Furthermore, the book of Revelation is, is sometimes confusing. It's a bit like a patchwork quilt or even a jigsaw puzzle. It's not a timeline or a series or a series. It's just a number of visions reported by the evangelist. The numbers used by John are symbolic, even though often misused by some in the Christian community. For example, the thousand years referred to in chapter 20 symbolizes a very, very long time. The number 1,000 has in Revelation an additional meaning. It is 10 cubed, or 10 to the power of 3. It symbolizes God's holy presence, since the Holy of Holies was cube-shaped. And we see a number of numbers used in John's Gospel that the numbers are symbolic. We shouldn't get hung up on them. It's the same as earlier in the book that talks about the 144,000. It doesn't mean exactly 144,000. It just means a large number of people. And if you think about it, 12 twelves, what do they come to? So in chapter 22, which we read, is an appendix or epilogue, and thus contains various warnings and exhortations. There are three main points. One, John sought to authenticate the book to show that its authority presented by the angel sent by Jesus. We are to believe it, obey it, and make it known, but not seal the book. <coughs> Two, there are appeals and warnings against a background of future judgment. We are to wash our robes. And this may refer back to chapter 7, where we read in verses 9 and 10, after, the, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then at the end of that reading, we hear the affirmation of Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon. We are the church, the people of God, sometimes battered, threatened, even persecuted, but nevertheless fearless, as the church militant. We want to walk in the sandals of the carpenter of Nazareth. We are declared in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So at the very end of our Revelation re reading, we see the church triumphant. It describes those for whom the fight is over. They have been through the great trials of life and have accepted forgiveness. They followed the Lamb and served him and now serve him before the throne of God. And an amazing development has occurred. The Lamb of God, the one who was slain, has become the shepherd. And chapter 7 and verse 17 tells us, For the shepherd at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's our future hope. But I wrote this piece late 2020. Are we prepared to change direction? Are we ready to hear the word of God? We have our plan and strategies. We have our lists. But God says, go a new way. Tell a new story. I'm giving you a new vision. The plan has changed. We know of Saul's Damascus Road story. Saul became Paul. He accepted a new plan. The story had changed. In turn, he helped build the church and change the world. Ananias feared Saul, but God said, go a new way, with a new vision. Ananias blessed Paul and baptized him, and with God's word in his ear, changed the plan and sent him on his way. Paul then heard and responded to the Macedonian call. Gideon was hiding in fear when the angel called him mighty man of God. Yes, God calls on unlikely men and women to prosecute his plan, men and women who are prepared to listen, respond, and walk in a new direction. Men and women who can walk in the sandals of the carpenter of Nazareth. So the challenge, I think, for all of us is are we 21st century Christians prepared to stop, listen, and go and take a different route? <coughs> Can we hear the Macedonian call and go where the Spirit of Jesus leads us? Labels of denominations or liberal, evangelical, or progressive, they mean nothing to the carpenter. Can we set aside these shibboleths? Can we be free to open our minds and be free to hear his words and walk a new pathway? Can we truly talk with all people? None are too high, none are too low. All are made in God's image. All are loved by him. Let's be free to walk that path. We can be the pew in the street for all people. We may be called to go in a new direction or just to stay put, but we are the church triumphant and at the very end of the Bible we hear these words. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So our next song will be, We Are Marching in the Light of God. This song started off its life as a protest song from South Africa and was sung by those protesting against apartheid, but it can still be sung as a call for freedom in solidarity with those who are oppressed or simply as a commitment to living in the light, love, and power of God. One of the references is to be found in Revelation 21 and verse 24. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendors into it. I think this refers to the New Jerusalem. So feel free to stand, march, sit, pray, but we are marching in the light of God.
Let us come before God in prayer. As we pray to the Father, Lord, send your spirit. Lord, we lift before you your wonderful creation, this earth and all its resources. We thank you for its magnificent beauty and diversity. Help us to as we look upon each of the things you have placed in this world and to reflect and praise you, the one who created it all. Lord, we ask for your help and guidance so that the people of the earth may meet their responsibility to care. Help each of us to make small changes that we can manage so that together these small changes will make a big difference. And as we enter Reconciliation Week and open our eyes to the injustice brought against the indigenous peoples of this land, we acknowledge the pain and shame of our history and the sufferings of our peoples, and we ask your forgiveness. Give us the courage to accept the realities of our history so that we may build a better future for our nation. Teach us to respect all cultures and teach us to care for our land and waters. Help us to share justly the resources of this land. Help us to bring about spiritual and social change to improve the quality of life for all groups in our communities, especially the disadvantaged. We thank you for the survival of indigenous cultures. Help young people to find true dignity and self-esteem by your spirit. We ask for your guiding spirit to fall upon those who are in positions of power and authority those who can make the bigger changes to drive forward real differences, to help us all in our mission to preserve and care for this earth. Lord, we pray for our new leaders in government as they settle into their first week facing the immense challenges ahead of them. We especially pray for our new Prime Minister, that he will serve and revere you in his words and actions. We humbly ask that you grant him grace as he faces the many challenges and opportunities both here and on the domestic scene and internationally. Lord, I don't think there is one person in this place or viewing online, who can comprehend the horrifying news that came out of America this past week. Father of love and hope, we bring before you all those in despair and darkness. We especially pray today for the families of the 19 children killed together with two of their teachers at the Robb Elementary School in Alvadi, Texas. Grant the comfort you have promised to all who mourn, to each mother, father, brother, sister, and friend. Reach out and encircle them in your loving arms. We pray that they may find peace, hope, and the love of Christ. God of all, we know that you are a great and mighty God and you promise to hear us when we pray. So as we sit in a moment of silence, we lay before you all those people, places and situations that are laying heavy on our hearts and we open ourselves too to hear your voice and feel your presence. And can I just add in that, as you quietly pray together to remember Ian Smith, whose 
in hospital in Ballarat at the moment and of course in grief for his friend Denise. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Judy. We will now take up our offering, I think. There's a bag going around. Yes. Father, we give you thanks for the many gifts and blessings that you have bestowed on us, and we bring to you and dedicate our offerings, however they have been given. We also dedicate our time and talents in your service. We also offer ourselves and pray that we may see a different future. Father, we thank you, and we come before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we go to our closure, just a couple of things. Firstly, I've been asked to remind you that next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday and you're asked to please wear something red to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And again, before closing, I'd like to thank people who made this service work. As I've said before, I get the easy bit here. I just have to come up here and talk away for a bit, but... We've had Iris um, making sure it all happens, Judy doing the readings. We had Robert putting the slides together, and of course, don't forget Simon. You just give him some um, hymns to play, and he seems to be able to work it out somehow. I could not do that, Simon. And also thanks to um, our team up the back who not only get it all to work here, but work out the YouTube, so that those remotely we would like you to feel part of who we are today. And it's, I know it's difficult for you sometimes, but you are still part of our community. So I'm going to end with a word of prayer, but after that, we're going to sing um, Shalom to you. And just remember that the blessing Shalom to you now is based on the ancient Hebrew concept of peace. And it means wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity, and carries with it an implication of permanence. It is deeper than the English word we know as peace. So shalom is something that is given to us in, um, from God, and we will sing that. I think, Simon, we might sing it through twice when we've finished. 
But our closing prayer is, um, I'm actually going to use John Wesley's prayer of dedication. I am no longer mine but yours. Put me to what you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And this is the covenant now made on earth. Let it be satisfied in heaven. Amen. So I say to you all, shalom to you.